We just removed all of the panels on Buell Planetarium and replaced them. It looks something like this. Oh. Yeah, you can see it's a one-to-one -one 360 image. That's a real catwalk. Wow. So lights lining up. That's why I forgot to move my water bottle. <laughs> I can see it all. <laughs> all right. And uh, we're going to do a quick uh, time lapse of what the construction looked like. I'm going to fade all the way to darkness for a moment. And here's a time lapse of the construction that took place to upgrade our universe here in the Buell Planetarium. The entire dome was repaneled with 197 new panels for just the right reflectivity and contrast for an all new projection system. There are 10 new projectors that will give us 52 million pixels of astronomical coolness. To do that required the work of uh, really hand cutting all of these panels on site. It was like watching modern day Da Vinci's at work <laughs> building this new dome. Every one of the 15,000 hand driven rivets had to be painted by hand to disappear into the dome. And now that our spaceship is newly renovated, let's take it for a spin. Uh, we're going to draw a sky facing north this afternoon. About quarter to 8 p.m. You can see our sun getting ready to set in the west. We are facing north from Carnegie Science Center. So let's say good night to our sun as we head off into the evening. the star I can see the stars now. now here in downtown Pittsburgh we have a beautiful skyline lots of city lights cars street lights imagine if all of that light was very well directed though so it wasn't scattering out into the atmosphere or imagine if we took an evening and turned off as many lights as possible and really allowed the starlight to come through what would we see they're regions of the sky, like states Ooh. on a map. So anything we discover in this part of the sky is part of Cassiopeia. And that's a common language, this map of constellations that astronomers all around the world can use. Now, the five constellations we found so far are called circumpolar. They stick near the pole star Polaris throughout the night. Let me show you what I mean. We'll start at about quarter to 11. Keep your eye on your favorite, whether it's the bear, the dragon, the home plate, the W. Keep your eye on it and watch what happens as we fast forward through the evening. They're starting to move, right? They appear to be rotating, but what's really rotating is the Earth. Yeah, as we move on our axis, our North Star stays fixed. If you would take our axis and stretch it out into space, you'd come pretty close to Polaris. And that's why the North Star was so handy for navigators sailing the oceans over the centuries. You can see these five constellations all night long and all year long as well, facing north. But if you look to the east, you'll see new stars rising. Just like our sun rises. Or look over to the west, you'll see stars setting just as our own sun sets. When you're not facing north, that's when things get interesting. What you'll see at prime time this evening is very different than what you'd see in three months, looking in the same part of the sky, east, west, or south. In fact, we are going to look south in just a moment to show you what I mean. Oh, it's morning. We've come to tomorrow morning, so I'm going to reset time <laughs> to this evening. And I'm going to clear the sky of this cast of characters 
so that we can face south and see what's up in the sky as part of our seasonal sky this spring. Now I'm not going to ask you to turn around. I'm going to turn the universe around you. If you get motion sick, I might close your eyes. But if you don't mind going for a spin, give me a countdown in three, two, one. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that fun? <laughs> Ooh, making me dizzy. I'm gonna close my eyes. All right, so we are facing south. You, you can go. see Mount Washington in front of you. What's the first thing you see in the sky as you look south? The moon, exactly. Take a moment now and see if you can find the Big Dipper again. It's gonna be high in the sky if we're looking south. Big Dipper. Oh, you have it yet? That one. I don't know if that one or... I All right, like I said, the Big Dipper <laughs> will point the way to lots of other things in the sky. If we're facing south, we're gonna use it to find the Zodiac. So we're gonna start by reaching up and tracing the handle of the Big Dipper. And everyone say with me, Arc to Arcturus. Whoa. All right. Whoa. Arcturus is an orange-red giant. It's part of the constellation Buotes. The Greeks saw a herdsman there. I don't know that I buy that. What I do see is a, a fish with a tail, and it's an angler fish with a little light up there. You guys buy that? Yeah? All right. Okay, let's see if you buy this. Turn your head sideways. Do you see an ice cream cone on a little stand and here's a yeah. straw? Yeah. All right. It's from Marguerite. Okay. Let's see if you buy this now. Do you see a little scoop of ice cream that fell off the cone here? <laughs> That's another constellation. Its Corona. name is Corona Cordialis, the Northern Crown. And we're halfway to the Zodiac. To find the Zodiac, let's come back up to the Big Dipper. Let's say it with me one more time. Arc to Arcturus. Arc to Arcturus, eh? And now, Spike uh. to Spica. Yeah, to that blue-white giant, Spica. It's in the constellation Virgo. of Virgo. And that's right where the moon is tonight. But those two steps will hop you from the Big Dipper all the way to the Zodiac. And you can find Arcturus and Spica even in... Uh, a sky here in the city. It's Those are two of the brighter stars you can find, even with some light pollution. Let's find a few more zodiac constellations while we're at it. Right below Virgo, there's a little trapezoid named Libra. Libra. Those are the scales. We're going to go on a safari now for Leo the Lion. So to do that again, we're going to find the Big Dipper. It's a great place to start. Let's all reach up and trace off the bowl of the dipper one more time, but we're going to go beneath the bowl. And tell me when to stop when you've come to a backwards question mark shape. Tell me when you see it. There might be one here. Yeah, I do kind of see one here. Keep on going. Let's find another one. All right. Yeah. Oh, I've seen it. Here's the one I was thinking of. There are probably uh, quite a few. But that big backwards question mark, that star right there is Regulus. And that backwards question mark will let you know you found Leo the Lion. Mm. Hmm. So again, the Big Dipper can point the way to all kinds of things. Now right next to Leo, very faint in the sky, is Cancer the Crab. And two bright stars here, Castor and Pollux. Those are Gemini, the twins. So you're probably starting to see a pattern, right? The zodiac arcs across the sky. It's in a region of the sky we call the ecliptic. And if you find the zodiac, you will find the planets. You'll even find the moon. It's in uh, almost the same plane. So we'll see all the other planets traveling through this part of the sky. That's because Earth and the other major planets orbit the sun in roughly the same plane. You can think of our solar system as a pancake. The sun is a big scoop of butter in the center. Earth, Mars, the others, they're all like little blueberries in that pancake. They're in the same plane. And if you stretched out that pancake in all directions, 
you would come to the zodiac. Those constellations are in the same plane. So if you find the zodiac, you will find the planets. And as it turns out, there's a planet visible in the night sky this evening. We're gonna see if we can find it. It's not in Libra. It's not in Virgo. I think it's in Gemini. Look toward Leo, I don't see anything there. Oh, where? I think it's in Gemini. It's not in Cancer, so that just leaves Gemini. Do you see anything that you might think is a planet over there? The one, the There one. is a planet in Gemini right now. Oh, I'm see, circle I got it, it. I got it. What planet do you think this one. is? Mars, yes. This is the last uh, time of the year to see Mars taking this final bow in the evening sky, low in the west. So make sure you get outside and, and check it out. In fact, let's get a slightly closer view of Mars. Here we go. Give me a countdown in three, two, two one. one. Blast off. Oh, oh my god. <laughs> Wow. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Ooh, wow. All right, say goodbye to the United States. There's the Pacific Ocean. Bye, Earth. See you, Moon. Should we head off to Mars? All right. Even moving at the speed of light, it would take 11 minutes for a radio signal to get there. We're gonna get there right now. We're moving Ooh. at the speed of show, a little faster. But here we are in orbit around the red planet. Now there's some darker areas, some exposed volcanic rock, but plenty of red stuff covered in rust, iron oxide. This what gives Mars it, uh, Rusty red color, it literally is rust. Mars is about half the size of planet Earth, mm -hmm. but it's got some of the most impressive geological features in the entire solar system. Wow. That's its North Polar ice cap. It's made of not just water ice, but dry ice as well. I'm gonna move the sun and take us into some more views of, of Martian geology. All right. We're gonna head toward the Tharsis region of Mars now. Can you see those three mounds right there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are all shield volcanoes. They're dormant now, but oh great big mound-shaped volcanoes. And wow. we're gonna fly into the biggest one right now. This is the Martian Mount Olympus, Olympus Mons two and a half times taller than Mount Everest. Mm. Pretty impressive, right? If you reach up and trace the base of that mountain with your finger, think about this, that one mountain is bigger than the entire country of France. Wow. The whole, the whole mountain would cover the country. Mars also has the biggest canyon in the solar system, and that's mm. going to be our next stop. We're coming up on Valles Marineris, Mariner Valley. That's this crackled streak you see across the face of Mars. On Earth, it would stretch from New York to Los Angeles. We can't even see the entire thing right now. I may have to move the sun and back us away from, there we go. Look at that, 2,500 miles wide. If you were in the Central Canyon, which is five miles deep, you couldn't even see from one side to another because the horizon is so vast. We're gonna fly in for a closer look. All this is real data. It comes to us from uh, the Mars Odyssey mission, MAVEN, other orbiting spacecraft. So we can take a look at the contours on Valles Marineris and even go in a little closer. What do you think, should we uh, head on in? All right, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> there you can see the how water once filled this basin, sculpted out the contours of these cliff sides and these little tributaries. Mars is at the very edge of 
a habitable zone in our solar system where there could have been liquid water, maybe even life in its distant past. Descended now to the atmosphere. Only 1% as thick as Earth's. Look at those beautiful red cliff sides. <clears throat> and Mars is in the news. The Perseverance mission touched down in Jezero Crater a couple months ago. It's looking for signs of life. It's going to drill a rock sample that another mission will bring back to Earth. So we'll have a piece of Mars, maybe on Earth in 10 or 15 years. And the Ingenuity helicopter just took the first powered flight of a robot over the Martian landscape. <laughs> Did you say bye-bye? <laughs> All right, yeah, let's say bye to Mars. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Mars is taking its final bows in the night sky, but if you find the zodiac, like I said, you can find the planets. And if you wake up early in the morning, say around four in the morning, you can see Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, so what do you say? Should we take a trip to Jupiter? Yeah. All right. You can also wait till August and Jupiter and Saturn will be up during prime time at night. Ooh. But we don't have All right, stars. here we go. Bye, Mars. <laughs> so I cannot see it. Preview of coming attractions. Our next stop is Jupiter. Ooh, there you go. Oh. Jupiter is a gas giant. It's the largest planet of all. In fact, all the other oh, planets would fit yeah. inside Jupiter with room to spare. Ooh, wow. Jupiter has rings. Did you see that? That's what that debris was. Sort of a faint ring system. Lots of hydrogen and helium, lots of ammonia Ooh. compounds and those swirling clouds to give us those different colors. Check out the North Pole of Jupiter here. That was imaged by the Juno spacecraft. It's real data we're looking at right there. See all those swirling storm systems. And no trip to Jupiter would be complete without looking at the great red spot. Even Galileo saw that. That one giant storm has been raging for hundreds of years and it's bigger than Earth. Mm -hmm. Now when Galileo looked at Jupiter, he also discovered four moons. That's what changed everything. He realized that other planets had moon orbiting them. And we had proof that Earth wasn't the center of it all. And one of the moons he discovered was named Io. We're gonna stop there real quick. It's one of my favorites. Io's in orbit of Jupiter, so we don't have to go too far. No more. Wow. It is in darkness right now, <laughs> so it doesn't look too impressive. But we'll uh, we'll see if we can advance time so we can get a better look at Io. There we go. All right. What does Io look like? I think it looks a little like a slice of pizza. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Io is extremely volcanic. Lots of sulfur compounds give it all those wow. different colors there. And it has quakes, basically tidal forces on land. So imagine standing on the land on Io, but going up and down 30 feet all the time. Mm. Uh, it's in a tug of war between Jupiter and some of the other big moons of Jupiter that are pulling on it. It is 100 times as volcanically active as Earth. Whoa. And Io was imaged and studied back in the 1990s by a spacecraft named, appropriately enough, Galileo. All right, for our grand finale, shall we head off to Saturn? Oh. All right, let's do it. I am punching in the coordinates for Saturn. That will be our last stop in our show today. So I'm going to count down three, two, one, and then everybody say with me, engage. Here we go. Three, two, one. All right. And Saturn's about twice as far from the sun as Jupiter. 
the distances get a lot bigger out here in the outer solar system. Each time we move, we're getting a beautiful view back into the center of our own Milky Way galaxy, too. Right. There we go, we have beautiful rings of Saturn. Quick look at the North Pole of Saturn. What shape do you see there? See a hexagon? Yeah, it's another big ball of gas, lots of different storm systems at different speeds, pinching and pulling on each other. And you end up with that, that hexagon at the North Pole, which I think is pretty amazing. Saturn's rings are extremely wide, but super thin. On average, they're only about 30 feet thick. 30 feet, which I think is amazing. And while we're parked out here at Saturn, uh, I can actually show you another planet. Spot one right now, I think. <laughs> That's us. Earth. We are looking back at our own pale blue dot from Saturn right now. All right, for our grand finale, I'd like to take a trip into the ring system itself. Who's with me? Who wants to go into Saturn's rings? Let's do it. All right, here we go. Setting in the coordinates, flying into the rings in three, two, one. We're heading towards a little gap in the rings to figure out why it's there. Hmm. Saturn's rings aren't solid, as you can see. They're made of billions of particles of ice and rock, Ooh. ranging in size from a grain of sand to a, a house or a boulder. But this is a little bit bigger. It's about 17 miles wide. It's a little object named Pan, kind of shaped like a walnut. That's just enough gravity that it clears a little path in the ring system, makes that gap, kind of pushes things out of the way, like a little dust buster. It's called a little moonlet or shepherd moon, kind of shepherding the ring system as it goes. All right, what do you think of Saturn's rings? Pretty spectacular, right? A lot of what we learned came from the Cassini spacecraft on its uh, daredevil flights between the gas giant and its rings the grand finale of its mission. Well, I've set course for one last stop. We're gonna head back to our beautiful blue marble. And take you back to Spaceship Earth. Get a nice view of the ocean here. Uh, and we'll set course for Pittsburgh. So you can spot the Great Lakes. Michigan's pretty clear right there. Ontario. Uh, keep an eye out for Pittsburgh's three rivers as they come together. You might even see the color difference between the Monongahela River coming up to meet the Allegheny coming down. As they form the Ohio, you can see the color difference kind of going, going through the Ohio for a little bit. Take in for a closer view at the Golden Triangle. Can you see the color difference there? Yeah. We're at the Science Center. Uh, that's... See if you can spot your car real quick. <laughs> no, I don't have that kind of data. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna spin you around one last time. We'll set back down here in the planetarium facing Mount Washington. Well, I hope you enjoyed your tour of the night sky. You are a great audience. Give yourselves a round of applause. Right.